the church yet. If he were, we'd be gone. We'd not be here. Jesus would come in all of his splendor and glory. And the Bible uh, teaches us when he comes, and we use the term, we call it a rapture, but it's a catching away of the saints. That hasn't happened yet. And I'm, I'm a believer that until that happens, God is going to be good to his people. God's going to be good to his church. And I believe that he has a great work for you and I to do. Amen? Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about more about the Son of God uh, we're looking at John chapter 5. Uh, we're going to read a few verses in John chapter 5, starting with the first verse. We'll probably read down probably to verse, uh, verse 8 or 9. The Bible says this, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in the Hebrew Bethesda. It has five porticos, and basically in your mind, if you could think of five porches, there were five porches surrounding this pool. And in these lay a multitude of those who were sick, they were blind, lame, and withered. And they were all waiting for the moving of the waters. The Bible says in verse 4, they waited for an angel of the Lord who would come down at a certain season, time of seasons, into the pool and stir the water. And then whoever was first after the stirring up of the water stepped in was made well from whatever disease with which he or she was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you wish to get well? And the sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Verse 8, Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your pallet or pick up your bed. Or other versions may say, pick up your bed and walk. And immediately the man became well and he picked up his bed, picked up his mat, picked up his pallet, and he began to walk. And now that was the Sabbath day. Father, we thank you for your word today. And we ask God that without adding to or taking away from your word that you would speak to our hearts Help us to understand something about you today, God, that would be life-changing for each and every one of us in this place. We just pause right now to thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing. We love you. Would you just join me right now, whether you do it in a, under your breath in a soft voice or if you want to just whisper it to the Lord, could we just take a moment just to thank him? All the things that we have to be thankful for, our home, our family, we used to sing a song years ago, the roof up above me and the shoes on my feet. Lord, we are so thankful, and we just bless you this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you for health, and thank you, God, for provision. Thank you for being a God who is there around the corner of every challenge and, and every situation that may seem like it sneaks up on us, but it didn't sneak up on you. You are fully aware and fully in control, and you are there for us, leading us and guiding us through every single situation. God, I love you today. I thank you and ask you to bless this, these few moments that we have together to look into your word. In Jesus' name I pray, and everybody can say amen. amen. I, I love the month of December. If you were here last year at this time, uh, we started something in December last year. It's a study of the book of John every December. And it's simply called Jesus, Son of God. Or we've been asking the question, who is Jesus? It is absolutely impossible for anybody whether a believer or a non-believer, to read the book of John and truly, truly not understand a little bit about Jesus and what it takes to be a Christian. And that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at how does the book of John affect our lives and cause us to want to align more with the life of Christ 
rather than our own lives. How many here would say you want to be more like Jesus and less like you? Yeah, all right. There's a few hands here today. Amen. And I saw somebody nudge the person beside him. He's talking right to you today. In John chapter 1, 2, and 3 that we studied last year, we discovered that John calls Jesus in chapter 1, Son of God, John 2, the Son of Man, and in chapter 3, the Divine Teacher. Last Sunday, we picked up this series, and we're continuing this through until Christmas morning. Uh, where are you going to be? Jan uh, December 25th, almost at January 25th. December 25th at 1030, unless you're just gone or have some really major plans. We're going to be in church December 25th. At 1030, I, I've had a few calls, you know, pastor friends of, you know, the last two months they've been calling and finding out what their other pastor friends are doing. And if I, I've, I've had a couple of calls and I'm like, well, what else would we do uh, on, on a Sunday but come together in God's house and worship Him? And we're doing that again here, and we're going to continue this message series right through to that morning. You'll get an abbreviated version that morning. Can somebody say amen? Uh, it is... Uh, uh, a day that we also want to respect uh, the things that you have going on, but we will be in God's house that day. I believe that He is more than a babe in a manger. He is more than a prophet, more than a wise man, more even than a teacher. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is undeniably the Son of the Most High God. And in John chapter 5, I want us to just look at this today. And you may... This morning, you know, somewhere during this message, you may say, wow, that's a very non-traditional uh, Christmas season sermon. I hope that you do say that because I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to minister to each and every one of us in this place today, me, you, the person sitting behind you, the person sitting next to you on this particular topic. John chapter 5, we discover Jesus as the great physician. And oh my, Frank, Pam, he is a great physician. Let me give you a couple of things to write down today. Number one, jot this down. The healing message and ministry of Jesus. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus says these words. He says, beginning in the 18th verse, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Can I tell you this morning that no matter where we turn in the New Testament, to where there is activity in the life of Christ. Can I tell you that we find that the working of miracles and healing is a vital part of the message and the ministry of Jesus Christ. There should be an amen in the house. Amen. During his three and a half years of public ministry, Jesus wanted the church to recognize him as a great physician. What you and I have just read in the book of Luke from chapter 4, Luke is actually, he's recording these words and, and, he's, and he's quoting, or Jesus is quoting from the book of Isaiah. By his own admission, he states that he was the one who was sent and anointed by God to heal. Let me give you a few scriptures this morning. If you're taking notes, just jot these down. Uh, we will have them on the PowerPoint. If you're visiting with us, we normally have them on a big screen, but because of our beautiful set that we have, we're, we're, we're just putting, putting the scriptures up on our, our, our TV monitors. But, but here are a few scriptures for you to jot down. Acts chapter 10, verse 38, talks about the origin of healing. Peter actually makes this statement in Acts chapter 10, and he says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth 
with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We understand, and there's various other scriptures, we understand that God the Father is interested in the physical and the emotional and the soul healing of his family. Amen. Peter says that healing originates from God. Then in Matthew chapter 10, here's another scripture for you to write down. Matthew chapter 10, verse number, uh, verse number 7 through 8 says, Jesus, speaking to his disciples, as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received and freely you give. See, this is what I find amazing right here. Let me just put a little tag right here in this, at this part of the message. Is that healing originates from God. God sent Christ. Christ is the one who came and healing ministry was a major part of Christ's ministry. But it didn't end with Jesus. Listen, I really feel badly for, for New Testament believing 21st century Christians who believe that healing, physical healing, ended with the dispensation of the disciples. That's not the case. Jesus tells the disciples right here that it doesn't end with me, it goes on through you. And then, listen to this, in John chapter 14, very truly I tell you, Whoever believes in me, Jesus is saying, will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things, not in quality, but in quantity. You will do greater than these, because I am going to the Father. Amen. Divine healing is from God, through Jesus, passed on to the disciples, and a gift an anointing that is given to the church, to believers. Healing has never, ever ceased or ended. Now, I put this in parentheses in my notes as a point for you that are here today to get a chance to preach. How many would like to preach today? Oh, shouts I can't control. Janessa, no, <laughs> she's like, no, you got me to do an interview, preacher, you're not getting me to preach. I have to ask, how many of you would raise a hand and say, Pastor Darren, I have experienced in my lifetime physical healing from the Lord? Just, just hold it up there and, and just look around for a moment. Okay, you can put your hands down. I wonder how many of you... And for those who are going to be watching our or are watching our live stream or who may tune in later to watch this on their website on our website, I wonder how many of you you shout it out and then I'm going to repeat it so those who are watching will get a chance to hear it now or later. But would you just shout out the physical miracle that you have experienced? Back was healed, Back was healed okay. Back was healed. Saved your life, like a tragic accident or, or from a tragic accident. Uh, Wilma, sciatic nerve, COPD, saved your life, eyesight, Alicia, healed from sickness, Healed from breast cancer next August. August, three years. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Hey, thanks for preaching. Give yourself a big hand clap. That was awesome. We didn't pick on everybody. But I think it's absolutely amazing if you listened to the different miracles that you have experienced of physical healing in your bodies. It brings me to this second and really my last point. Uh, but you know that my last point is very similar sometimes to what Paul said, was it in Philippians? Uh, 
<laughs> yeah, finally, my brethren, these things. And he goes on and he writes several more chapters and books. But anyway, this is my last and sec- second last point, that the great physician knows absolutely no limits. That's what you actually heard here today. See, I... I, I almost wish we had, you know, two hours to really unpack this chapter because it is so powerful. And I'm going to do my best in just a few more moments to help us to understand what's really happening here. The great physician in John chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. We read, I think, verses 1 through 8 or 9. But in 1 through 15, we have what I feel is, is one of the greatest snapshots that we have in Scripture of not only society and people then, but I think people today in the 21st century. There was a diversity. There were various needs that were represented. The Bible tells us that, that some were blind and you know, some were impaired from their birth. There just was a diversity of, of needs of people who had gathered at this place were an angel, remember, healing the origin, it, it, or, it, the origin is from God. So God sends this angel at certain seasons who comes and stirs, or another word is moved these waters, and, and, and there were those who had been receiving healing from various. It didn't matter. The Bible simply says whoever was first. It wouldn't have mattered if they were blind. It wouldn't have mattered if they had sciatic nerve problems. It wouldn't have mattered if they had breast cancer. It wouldn't have mattered if they had, you know, de- degenerative, degenerative discs. Say that 10 times real fast. It wouldn't have mattered what their problem or ailment was. Whoever stepped into the water was healed. That just shows me that there is no limit to what God can heal. No limit to the work of the great physician. That also means no limit to what the disciples were able to do when they prayed in the name of Jesus. And nothing different for you and I as believers today. Look at the miracles, physical healings represented here today. And I won't ask each one, but it's very possible that those of you who raised a hand, you either had two or three brothers or sisters in the Lord lay hands on you. Maybe you came to an altar at a service just like this where somebody was talking about healing and you were prayed for by the ministry team or by the pastor or the pastoral staff and received a healing. Maybe some of you were home laying flat on your back with a Bible draped out down across your chest That you had just been reading the word of God. And you just begin to quote scripture. And oh, I love this one. That says, he, Jesus, was wounded for my transgression. Bruised for my iniquities. The chastisement of my peace was upon him. And by his stripes I am healed. Oh, I love that scripture. Healing from God to Jesus through the disciples. To believers to receive but also to pray and to see miracles happen. There's absolutely no limit to his operations. John chapter 14, verse 27, the word of God says, My peace I give to you. There's probably folks here today who you're thinking, well, you know, physically, I mean, there's really always, always something that we could be needing from God physically, but Does God heal the mind? Does God heal the emotions? He says here, He'll give you peace. He heals the emotions. Matthew 8, 17, He bore our sickness. That's the body. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. It's very possible as different ones were shouting out different things that God has healed you of, that somebody was just waiting for me to point to them. And there's probably at least one who was going to say, he saved my soul and he healed my soul from the sickness of sin. Oh, God is so good. Mind, body, and soul. Verses 4 through 7. This is the key point this morning. I really want us to take this home. Jesus shows up 
to this pool in the Hebrew tongue called Bethesda. And at this pool, the Bible helps us to understand that not only was there no limit to the operations of God through Christ, but there was no limit to the understanding of Jesus. Jesus comes to this one man. And the Bible says that Jesus knew, does it not? You read it there. Jesus knew that he had been there a long time. Jesus knew the pool. Jesus knew the man. Jesus knew how long the man had been there. And then, Joe, that question that we sometimes think we understand it, you know, theologically, books have been written on it. This powerful question that Jesus asks him. There have been so many sermons on it, but will we really understand the power of this question here? Maybe someday we may when we see him and become more like him. Jesus asks him, would you like to be well? The translation of that word is actually healed. Here he is, lame for 38 years. Jesus asks him, would you today like to be healed? And then, Danny, the response of that man. I'm going to park here for just a few moments before we conclude the service today. Think about those words, Ryan. He says, Jesus, I'm a lame man, unable to walk. And it always seems that when the water is stirred, somebody else steps in before I. He says, I don't have the ability and no one to put me into the water that I might be healed. If you have, if you're taking notes or if you're, you know, doing it with your electronic device, write this one word down. This is the word that the Holy Spirit has been speaking to me about all week, to me, to Darren. Because this word, I'm going to be transparent, this word I identify with. And so will you. And the word is broken. That's all I can really come up with, Karen. When I read this portion of Scripture and I read his response, man, I mean, I know what we're thinking. We sit here today, right? Uh, for the most part, we're pretty flexible and agile and most of us can get around pretty good, right? Come on. Come on. Better than the man at the pool of Bethesda that day. And his response to Jesus is, I have nobody to put me in the pool. I mean, we're sitting here thinking, man, I'd have just said, yes. Do you want to be healed? And you're thinking that today. I mean, if, if Jesus, in, in a, a visible, tangible, touchable form, appeared here today, and Jesus said, do you want to be healed? I mean, after you, you know, drag yourself up off the floor <laughs> from shaking, you'd probably say, yes, I want to be healed today, Jesus. Or would you? See, there's something that I understand about me. And I think that there's something that we need to understand about ourselves. Is that oftentimes, when the Lord asks us questions, catch this now, we give Him Broken responses. That was a broken response. Jesus, I have no way in. Somebody always gets in before me. Somebody, I guess God loves more. Nobody cares about me, Jesus. Do you want to be healed? And his response, 
has broken in it. Have you ever had the Lord ask you a question and you give Him a broken response? Broken responses include all the things that we say, hear me now, this is for somebody today, probably a majority rather than a minority, because He's been speaking it to me all week. Broken responses include all the things that we say out of frustration, disappointment, hurt, anger, grief, fear, fatigue, jealousy, negativity, disobedience, and disbelief. I'm talking to my brothers and my sisters today and those who may be watching us right now or those who may watch us later to know for us to understand that I understand there are times that God asks questions of me and I'm giving him a response that is broken how many times do we open an altar here at our church we're an altar church by the way at the end of most messages, we don't just, you know, pray and send you home. We give you an opportunity to be prayed for by some folks who would love to join with you in prayer, even today in this service, and even Christmas Sunday morning, December 25th. And we open the altars, and I, I know, hey, I've been there. I've sat in pastor's conferences. Huh, Pastor Gary? And I've had the Holy Spirit tapping me on the shoulder the whole time the guest speaker is sharing. And the altar gets open and I get this whatever. Disbelief? Fear? Holy Spirit taps me on the shoulder as He does sometimes with you. Come on now, I'm not just preaching to the choir. There is literally a choir here this morning though, so hey, you know. He taps you on the shoulder and says, be prayed for. And then what do we do? We start giving broken responses. It could be, I had been prayed for before and didn't get a healing. Why be prayed for again? Matter of fact, Pastor Darren prayed for me and I didn't get a healing. So why should I go be prayed for again? Oh, Lord, I've just had this so long now. I guess it's just your will, my, your cross for me to bear, and I'm just going to take it to the grave. Oh, Lord, those are some nice people down there, but they really don't care about me. If somebody cared about me, they'd call me. Somebody cared about me, they'd visit me. Somebody cared about me, they'd this, they'd that. Can I help you understand something? Folks, those are broken responses. Now, that doesn't negate the responsibility of the church to care for one another. But if your relationship with God hinges on somebody... I guarantee there is something emotionally broken there. We all have dependency. But God is the one who says, when you can't depend on man, you can depend on me. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well, Lord, I hear you speaking to me. You know that the church is... There's several areas of ministry, you know, they've been asking for help in this area or that area. And, and Lord, you know that I just don't have the time to get involved in. That's a broken response. Oh, you say, ah, va, preacher, shame on you. Shame on you for saying, because you, you don't know. Yeah, preachers work one day a week. Come join us. For a week. Come and join us. I don't think that we preachers work any harder than anybody else. But I'm going to tell you, there is something that I think 
the majority of people in this room can identify with, and that is Janessa Time Management. Most of the time, we feel like time is managing us. Come on. But I'm going to tell you, not managing time is no excuse for not offering our bodies as a sacrifice as unto the Lord for service in His kingdom to do something. Man, this production wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for the people who put the set, built the set, the people who've been practicing in the choir and the cast since August and Ashley and Ryan writing and Karen and Carissa trying to make all this happen since June or July. The stuff just doesn't happen. Children's ministry programs just don't happen. Oh, the Lord will provide. He does provide. But maybe He's wanting to provide through you. And He speaks to your heart. And we get so used to feeling that tap on the shoulder and then saying, well, Lord, you know, I, how about somebody who's retired? You know, they have all the time in the world. You know what I'm talking about. And all the retired folks here are saying, we're needing some folks who aren't retired to step up to the plate and help. We're not getting any younger. Everybody over 60. Amen. Yeah. We give broken responses. Oh, this one's going to hurt just a little. You might want to pull your foot in out of the aisle. <laughs> When the offering plate is passed, week after week, and the Bible talks to us very clearly. And I'm going to give you a portion of Scripture here in just a moment that has to do with covenant. When it comes to tithing, come on now. Lord, I can't. Car payment, house payment, this payment, that payment, this need, that need. Food in the belly, food in the children's belly, shoes on their feet. Lord, it's all piling up. You'll understand, God, because you're a good father, but broken, broken response. Every time we think we have a good reason for breaking covenant with God, it's broken. Amen. I should have a few more on that one. I'm almost done. 37 miracles in the New Testament of Jesus Christ are recorded. I could go down the list. I could show you person after person in the New Testament who went from broken response to a healed person's response. You know, I'll say this. God deals with desperate people. Listen, I don't stand here like, come on now, honey. I'm not perfect. Amen. There's things, Ed, he's still working on me. And I never, ever hope that you, you feel I stand here, you know, as a pastor or a preacher of the gospel. You know, it's, it's always said, if you got one finger pointing out, you got three pointing right back at you. I've walked this path. I'm walking this path. I understand this path. I can empathize. I can sympathize with each and every one of you here this morning, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And then I can look at God's Word and I can show you that out of the 37 miracles of Jesus, you know, when He healed the blind, uh, the blind mute demoniac, when Jesus healed at the pool of Bethesda, when Jesus healed the ten lepers, when Jesus healed a man with dropsy on the Sabbath. When Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And he's interested in mother-in-laws too. Don't look to your left or your right. Just keep looking right up here at me. When he cast demons out of a man into a herd of pigs. When he raised Jairus' daughter to life. When he turned the water into wine. I mean, all of these things, if you trace these stories, there's somebody broken in these stories 37 times. I mean, just the water being turned into wine. There was a panic. They were running out of wine. This was going to be an embarrassment. Why did Jesus turn the water into wine? You know, just to make himself look good. No. 
He was concerned about those who were, who were hosting this party. And he simply has the water turned into wine because he cares about the emotions of people. Aren't you glad that God cares about your emotions? How you feel, how you are feeling, He cares. Broken people. And then, I just have a handful of scriptures left to share this morning. We're just about done. The caboose is now on its way. John 21, 25. Have you ever thought about this scripture? John says in the 21st verse, if my calculations are somewhat close, and I know that, I know that probably Derek and Emily are going to do the calculations real quick, but, but if Jesus tarries and I'm here this long, we'll get to John 21 in uh, uh, 2018. I don't know why. I'm just guessing. In John 21... He says, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were to be written down, he says, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Healing was a vital part. Being great physician shown to us by John in John 5 was a major part of the ministry of Of Jesus Christ. And the last thing is that there is no limit to his duration. I want to show you just quickly two covenants. How many of you recall, remember the verse of Scripture, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 6 I, the Lord, do not change. Right? I mean, if you struggle memorizing Scripture, you at least have one New Testament, Jesus wept. And one old, I, the Lord, do not change. Do you know that this was spoken in verses that deal with covenant? God was actually challenging the nation of Israel to maintain their commitment to tithing. Oh no, we're back on that topic. Oh yes, their commitment to tithing. And this is what he says. He says, I change not. And because God didn't change, God doesn't change. God simply says to them that the nations of this world will call you blessed. If you keep up your part of our covenant, because I do not change, I will keep up my part of the covenant. Period. I change not. Now, I love that scripture. But here's another covenant scripture. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same. Oh, man. Yesterday, today, and forever. This is what's neat. These verses are also spoken in the midst of a covenant. In Malachi chapter 3, God is talking to, to the nation of Israel about the covenant of tithing. But here in the New Testament, because Jesus never changes, He has and He will maintain the ability throughout all of mankind's history to be unlimited in how He impacts and when necessary interrupts the lives of His people. The Apostle Paul got a hold of this. Oh, I like this. I like this. I like this, Ashley. I like this, Lori. I like this, Tom. In in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, Paul says this way. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever he says amen do you know what he got a hold of he got a hold of the covenant that Jesus was a better high priest that Jesus came with a better covenant and it is Jesus who said things aren't going to get real nice looking but I change not What doesn't change about Jesus? 
the ministry of Jesus. He will always be the Son of God. He will always be the Son of Man. He will always be the divine teacher. Last Sunday, he will always be the soul winner. John 5, he will always be the great physician. Would you stand with me? And while you're standing, can we give the Lord some thanks and praise for being a great physician in this place today? Father, we praise you today. A great physician. I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads and close your eyes right where you're standing today. We're not going to drag this altar call out, but you know this.